today. Uh, at tonight's board meeting, uh, we're going to do something a little bit different based upon a discussion we had as to a method that may be more conducive to our discussion of items in terms of how we take items with regard to their sequence. Uh, with that in mind, we're going to receive, discuss, and take public comment on presentations regarding Central Health Partnerships with Seton Healthcare Family and a proposed master agreement, as well as other agreements that we've discussed for what seems like months now, including comparisons of new and existing agreements. I'd like to take a moment to go through tonight's agenda and point out a change, as I mentioned, to the presentations uh, based upon something that we hope um, will be more conducive. Uh, what we hope we'll be able to do is to be even more informed in terms of hearing all comments, not just those from the presenters, but those from the public as well. So we have invited the public who are here to listen to the presentations and then participate in a public comment session after the presentations and before our board discussion. So again, we'll have presentations after the presentations are done, We'll have public comment at that time in accordance with our public comment <coughs> protocol that we've used uh, heretofore, and then we will be able to have any discussion as a board, of course, and um, go from there. Uh, we hope that this will be an opportunity for citizens to provide their input and views about presentations about the respective agreements directly to the board. And if you wish to make a com public comment, as you may well know, uh, Carlos Format, who's our, uh, our host with the most is, who's probably still out <coughs> in the lobby greeting folks as they come in to make sure that they sign up, will again go through the protocol and announce each speaker before uh, they come before us. Um, as you can see on the screen before you in terms of the agenda, opening remarks, which I'm doing, and the following presenters in that order. Uh, before we start with the presenters, I'd like to also go to our overall agenda. We have four items that were posted today, and I want to make sure that you're aware that item number three, which is receive, discuss, and take appropriate action on the agreement between Central Health and Tex Health Central Texas, that item has been pulled from the agenda uh, for today and will be forthcoming at the time that is deemed necessary. So just know that agenda item three is no longer on the agenda. With that in mind, uh, the first presenter will be Greg Hartman, who is president and CEO of Seton Medical Center Austin and University Medical Center Brackenridge. Greg has presented many times, as uh, we are aware, with, aware of, rather. And tonight he will talk specifically about the master agreement and Seton's approach to transitioning to an integrated delivery system with their role and responsibilities as defined by the master agreement. And so Greg, as you walk in, we are ready for your presentation. And thank you for being here. Sure, thank you very much for this opportunity. As you know, been here a few times talking about this several times over the last uh, few months, so it's nice as we're starting to wind down. I want to let everybody know Tim LaFray, who's uh, a lot of folks here have worked with a lot too as of this. He's with me as well from Seton. He's been um, helping a lot on the negotiations. I just want to make a few comments. Again, stick around for questions as we go through the night. If anything comes up, just make a few things. One, I just want to thank the board and the staff of Central Health. You know, this has been we first probably started talking about something like this probably a year and a half, almost two years ago, maybe just the concept of thinking about delivering care in a different way and the concept of a new teaching hospital and the medical school and everything else too. And so um, none of this would be possible without a public entity like you guys willing to take this on and deal with it. And I also really want to thank the staff because you have some incredible staff folks here who've done some incredible work. There's been a lot of long hours in this building and lots of other buildings to think about things and to look at different models and everything too. So you really should be proud of your staff. Having said that, and as we get to the end, I also know we still have issues, things on the contracts and other stuff that we're still working out. So um, I know there's a lot of meetings this weekend to keep working on some of this documentation and the contracts and other things. We're going to be meeting on Monday. Um, you know, we think it's important to get this right as opposed to, you know, making sure that the pub final public documents, we've got the legal issues worked out too. So glad to see that we're going to take a little bit extra time to make sure we got the documents right. And Greg, if you don't mind, can you just slow down and go over that piece again? Because sure. I think some of us may be tracking with you, but I want to make sure for the benefit of everyone that's here that they understand what you just said. Sure, sure. You know, there's, and I know there's going to be a lot of talk tonight about the different documents, the master agreement, which is really sort of the constitution that we're developing, sort of the concept and vision and really critical pieces of this agreement 
a lot of that's been done. I think that's really close to being done. But then there's some other additional legal documents, the lease agreement, which is really a, a more of a land kind of lease agreement, traditional lease agreement than the old Brackeridge lease, which had a lot of services in it. And then, of course, the services agreement that deals with the services Seton's going to be providing, continue to provide the services we've provided for a long time with the safety net population and how we're going to provide additional services and new services into the future. A lot of those details, and I think we're, we're very close and similar in terms of the concepts and things. I know from a legal perspective, there's still a lot of issues to be worked out. Not a lot, but I think a few issues to be worked out on the final language in those, in those contracts. So again, there's going to be a lot of time spent this weekend to work on it, and I think um, that may push back the final documentation a little bit, but I don't think there's anything major. We certainly, from Seton's perspective, don't feel like there's anything major there. There are just some important issues to make sure we define correctly so everyone's um, happy and comfortable. Hopefully this document's going to be a living document and something that drives this community for a long time, 20, 50, 100 years maybe, so I think we need to get it right. So just a slight delay do in the documents reaching finalization, if you to get will, the final, a lot the final, of work being done this weekend. Exactly, the finalization of the closure and right. no big issue that we are Either I think that's safe to of. say. Of course, when you have lawyers in a room, there can always be a big issue. But I think from best we can tell, I think we've pretty much agreed on the major central themes, and it's a matter of making sure we've got the language right and we've got a document that'll live beyond. You know, one of the tricky things about this agreement is we're doing this within the constra constraints of a, of a state regulatory system and a federal regulatory system, too, which is evolving and changing as we're doing this. And so we have to be very cognizant of what HHSC, the Health and Human Services Commission, is, is wanting from us, and CMS up in, up in D.C. as well. Both those agencies have told us they're really excited and think the innovative model that we're developing is potentially a national model for what we're trying to accomplish. But ironically, that same model that they're so happy about doesn't fit well into some of their regulatory structures sometimes too. So we have to be very careful in terms of the language we design and how we write these contracts to make sure they fit to the regulatory structure as well too. So all that is sort of making this a complicated document, more complicated document than if it was just Seton and Central Health coming together with the contract, I think probably. Okay, with that preface, I think we're ready for your presentation. Good. Well, again, I don't, have, I don't have a lot to say. I mainly just want to kind of touch upon a few things that we've talked about before. One of the things that I think is really important to recognize is just sort of the significance of this public-private partnership that we've had here. You know, since 1995, Seton and the city of Austin, and that's, of course, evolved into the Central Health Organization, have had a public-private partnership that I think has really done some incredible things for this community, and we still have a long way to go. There's still a lot of our population that doesn't have the access to health care that it needs and we can always improve in quality but I think the public-private partnership has proved to be a great asset for this community when you think about the ability to, to provide services if you think about um, the development of University Medical Center Brackridge into a level one trauma center into a teaching hospital now that can handle um, the residents from one of the best medical schools in Texas University of Texas Southwestern um, uh, a facility that's really met the safety net needs of this community and also the complex trauma level kind of needs of this community. I think the partnership between the two of us has been a great partnership and it's kept tax rates relatively low as well too compared to the rest of the state. So I think that's something we can be proud of. I think when we first start talking about this, we recognize that both of our organizations have a real commitment and a mission to take care of the poor and vulnerable and to try to improve healthcare overall for our communities. And in a lot of communities, the 1115 waiver and some of the changes that were going on I think we're perceived as perhaps problems or challenges or, or things that were difficult to deal with. I think it's been interesting that our two organizations sort of embraced the 1115 waiver and realized because of the public-private partnership we have, there's the ability to maximize federal dollars and federal uh, uh, leverage federal dollars to spend down here and really to create something very different that doesn't just try to replicate the old healthcare system of the past, but really does try to take advantage of where healthcare is going. Seton has, has recognized for a couple years now the fundamental change that's happening to healthcare in this country. Um, we, as a matter of fact, changed our name from the Seton Family of Hospitals to Seton Healthcare Family a year or so ago in recognition that it isn't just about hospitals anymore. True healthcare and the way the system is developing is as much about how we deliver care in the right place at the right time for the right cost as opposed to just having great hospital services. Um, and that really does change the way we think about healthcare delivery. How do, we, how do we move healthcare delivery into the communities, into community clinics, into people's homes, into different settings where we can provide great care <laughs> at lower cost and get better outcomes? And we've begun as an organization to go through that change and really think about how you deliver care in a much more of an ambulatory <laughs> setting and a community setting. The community care collaborative that we're creating together, I think that takes that to a whole nother step, which is identifying ways for us to think about the safety, the delivery of safety net um, healthcare 
not just as a place where people can come when they get sick, but how do we actually proactively take care of folks so that they have better access to health care, they have better quality of life, and it's not just a place you come when you get sick, but we actually try to improve the quality of life for the populations that we're dedicated to. The Community Care Collaborative, I think, um, really does accomplish that in so many different ways by refocusing uh, uh, resources into the community, into the community clinics, um, helping as a part of the new hospital that Asc Ascension and Seton are hoping to build, providing a different type of service in our hospital system, but really beginning to think hard about where do you provide the right kind of services and how do we rethink that. And of course, this affiliation also is allowing us to embrace and take in the whole University of Texas at Austin Medical School that's coming along as well. We've begun having some conversations with UT, and of course we currently run, we currently um, uh, support the residency programs that exist, and we're talking to UT Austin now about the U UT Medical School. And there's a real commitment at UT to develop not only an incredible research intensive medical school, which I think is gonna be the envy of the country once it gets up, but what's really exciting to see the commitment from the university not only to do wonderful research, but to also really focus its efforts and prioritize this medical school to take care of community needs. So unlike some medical schools where the focus is, what do we want to do research on? This is a medical school that's gonna say, what is it that the community needs? And then how do we develop programs based on community needs? Um, and then how do we develop research and other resources based on what the community wants? I think it's a really um, great sign for this community that UT recognizes, and this is a unique situation where Local property tax dollars are a large source of the revenue funding for a medical school, and they recognize that gives them a different call and a different mission than other medical schools. And I think when you combine with what UT is doing, with what Seton is doing, and what Central Health is doing, we have the opportunity to really have a true community care collaborative. It's not just the name of an organization, but it really is a different approach to how we take, take care of folks and rethink how we're, gonna, how we're gonna do this process. I think this collaboration, too, really assesses, really changes the way we think about the sustainability of the safety net system. Again, I think in the past, too often safety net has been about how do you minimize the amount of service you have to provide to folks who don't have funding and how do you create a place for them to go when they're sick. I think this is a model that says there's a different way to approach it, which is let's take care of folks in the community and try to reduce health care needs and then try to find ways that you reinvest the dollars that you save into a better system. And I think we're going to create a system which not only provides much better safety net care, much better care for our safety net population. I think we're gonna learn things and develop systems of care that are good for our entire population. And folks, whether they have insurance or not, are gonna find that the kind of, the way we're delivering care, the way we're thinking about proactive community care is gonna improve health care throughout this entire community. And I think the Community Care Collaborative is gonna be a big part of that. So I think I'd like to just end with those comments, be available for any questions you, may, you guys may have as we go through, and I know as David and others present different parts of this, we'll be more than happy to answer any questions you have about Seton's role in the collaborative. And Greg, before you leave and mm -hmm. we have Dr. Andy come up, can you just give a very high level sense of the timeline we're looking at again, just to refresh sure. everyone's memory? Well, first I'll tell you from Seton's perspective, um, of course, we're going forward with approval for the new, for the new teaching hospital. Um, and yesterday, actually, we had a very significant vote up in St. Louis with Ascension Health, which was um, what we call the CIC, the Capital, Capital Initiatives Committee, I believe is what CIC stands for. That was sort of the last really big hurdle before the final vote that we have, which is on June 11th. So hopefully on June 11th, we'll get the final vote, uh, but we're feeling really positive because of the vote yesterday, which was the financial, the financial committee vote. So that'll happen on June 11th. Um, we've got these different documents that I think David Hilger is going to walk through. We've got a little bit of finalization to do on those with the legal work. Hopefully over the weekend we'll get all these legal issues done. Sometime next week we'll be able to get um, the new documents out to the public whenever that occurs. Again, I think it's important to do that correctly so the documents we get out we know are going to um, be the right documents and they can withstand the regulatory, um, regulatory scrutiny that we're going to have. Um, and then hopefully by end of this month or early in June, I'm hoping we've got this all finalized. We go to Ascension on June 11th, and I think we're ready to start. Our goal is to begin making some preliminary organizational decisions on the CCC over the summer and begin the full CCC board meeting with um, a full budget and, and board and everything else around October 1st of this year. Great. Thank you so much okay. for that. Thank you. And we thank you and Tim both for uh, sticking around because we are partners in this for sure. hearing the entire dialogue as well as the comments from the public. Thank yeah, you very much. Thank you.
Next up, we're going to have Dr. Andy Aguanobi and, and Dr. Andy, um, we might as well get like a, a special sleeping room I know. here, a sleeping bag for you. Uh, I know I can say on behalf of my colleagues, uh, your tremendous insight has been very, very helpful to us through this process. Uh, the depth and, and width of your experience uh, has really enabled us to, to get a better grip or handle on the context for going down this path. Um, that is upon us. And again, you go without an introduction, but I'll give another. Uh, you're a director of Berkeley Research Group, and you've been working with us to look at our local approach as articulated in the master agreement to make sure it fits within the changing national healthcare landscape. Uh, again, as Greg mentioned in his presentation, it's not just how we think about this here in Texas. As we well know, at the federal level, we have all sorts of changes, but within that, we have to look at uh, the review that we get through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So we're looking forward to hearing your perspective mm -hmm. as you have capably guided us thus far in this journey. Thank well, you. Thank you for your kind words and thank you for uh, having me today. It's actually been a real privilege for me to work with uh, Central Health and, and the Board. Um, well, on the national level, uh, every healthcare delivery system has recognized the need for change. And every system I would say that I have been involved with and, and others um, are either planning a s significant change or already undergoing change. And this is in response to a few key elements of health care reform um, or the Accountable Care Act, uh, which, which has been initiated by the federal government but will be followed by all payers. And that's one of the, 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 the recognitions that systems have. Some of the key elements that um, are causing these, uh, what I call, tectonic shifts in the healthcare industry are, one, the, the plans to bundle payments. So, for example, take, uh, having hospitals and physicians uh, be paid one lump sum, is a simple way of putting it, instead of paying them separately for uh, episodes of care for patients. Um, the decision to pay less for readmissions within 30 days, so if a patient is discharged from the hospital and ends back up in the hospital within a week, less payment to the, the providers. The decision to stop paying for errors uh, and poor care. Um, the decision to um, financially penalize providers uh, for poor information systems, so if you don't have a good electronic medical record that works and is meaningful, uh, you don't get paid as much. And then on the positive side, uh, paying more for good care, so value-based purchasing. And all the payers are watching the lead that the federal government is taking uh, nationally. But the bottom line is, the goal of the, of the government nationally uh, for all of the providers is, to, is, a, is what we call triple aim, is to improve the quality of care, it's to decrease the cost of care, and it's in, to improve the health of populations. Now, um, what the government has realized, the federal government, CMS, has realized from years of dealing with, the in, with our industry, with hospitals and physicians, etc., is that it's easy to reduce cost if you're willing to sacrifice quality. And it's easy to improve quality if cost is not an issue. But it's really hard to do both. And it's almost asking for world peace to improve the health of populations, particularly for individual providers that don't deal with all the aspects of care for those populations. So th what th those key elements that I mentioned are the government's way of pushing providers to do what is necessary, the heavy lifting, the difficult change that is necessary to, um, to get to the, that triple aim. So you bundle payments, you force coordination of providers, etc. And that's why every system is um, contemplating or embarking on change. We've really got to a tipping point in our industry and we're all doing that. So I work specifically with quite a few clients and they're all undergoing change of various kinds, but it's always, uh, or thinking about it, and it's very dramatic. So at the three hospitals of Yale New Haven Health System, which has, you know, they have a 1,000 bed hospital, a 300 bed hospital, and, um, and uh, 160 bed hospital, and various physicians, um, I'm working with Berkeley Research Group, and I'm leading a clinical redesign effort on the inpatient and the outpatient side, which I'll spare you the details, but is really about doing everything <laughs> possible with the clinical <coughs> service lines to decrease cost and, and simultaneously improve quality. Um, the, um, uh, another health system that I've worked with decided, uh, it was hospitals and physicians, and it decided to affiliate with uh, an HMO. 
uh, that used to be not, not, there was no enmity between them and the HMO, but they were definitely different kinds of organizations. And they decided, we'll come together and we'll share physicians so that we can decrease cost and improve quality and improve the health of the populations, because they, they bring different elements to that. Um, another hospital I work with is, um, I, actually I work with three large hospital systems that are different than each other, uh, totally separate systems, hospitals, physicians, that are thinking about coming together, affiliating together for two simple reasons. One, to reduce the costs overall, and two, to uh, improve the, po the, the population health of their adjacent populations. It's really about doing whatever you can do to um, do more with less, provide better quality with less payment or less cost. And that's really the driving uh, factor for systems nationally. And of course, many are uh, planning or developing accountable care organizations, and there's some in this community. Um, uh, others are, um, uh, you know, uh, are purchasing uh, physicians, uh, practices, which can't be done in most hospitals here in Texas, but it's really the same goal as the CCC or an ACO, and that is bringing physicians together in terms of uh, providing care for, for uh, people. So, you know, with that, you know, what I, th what, when I, when I look at what um, hospitals are doing across the country, um, the common theme across all of those organizations is that the status quo isn't viable for the long term. That what we're doing now, and again, the government has recognized that, they've tried the status quo for a long time, it's not working, and providers have now recognized that. They've also recognized that incremental change won't be enough. Just tweaking, you know, adding an extra mid-level provider in the emergency department of your hospital to uh, case manage patients, uh, that's not going to be enough. We're talking really a significant discontinuous change that will get us to the point. It's, it's, almost, it's like the change in 1965 when you had Medicare. You know, this is the kind of change we're talking about. Significant change for all providers. And it's a little bit scary, but there's also, as Greg mentioned, huge opportunity when it's embraced. Uh, and, and, thought, and, and done in a thoughtful, methodical, uh, um, uh, accountable manner. One other common theme is that no organization can do it alone. By definition, to improve the health of populations, you need all of the providers who treat those populations to be involved. And then finally, I would say uh, there is no, one thing I've noticed across the country is there's no cookie cutter approach. Because communities are different, systems are different, um, communities have to decide what structures are best for them when they're talking about transformation. And I think that what Central Health um, and its partners, Seton and others uh, that are involved in these, this, uh, this current um, uh, transformation of the healthcare delivery that we're talking about, I think what Central Health is doing is, is, is in line with national trends, but it's also very nicely customized to local needs. Um, and, and because of that, I think it's created uh, a unique model. And I, and I say that because many systems that I've seen are simply reading the literature about what's happening na uh, nationally. And nationally, they say, go do an ACO, so they do an ACO. Or, or merge with your partner for capital needs, so they merge. But what I've seen happen here from the board and from everyone, the staff I've been working with, is an extremely thoughtful approach about what is best for Travis County, what is best for the population we're talking about in the CCC, what is best for the strengths that we have currently. Um, and I think that has made what I would consider to be a unique model, and one that if it works as planned, uh, which I believe it will, could, would, could very well serve as a national model for similar communities. Because nobody has figured it out quite fully, and, <coughs> and a lot of haven't done the amount of work that you've done. I also think it's unique because it's truly, in my mind, it's truly transformative. Um, when you think about the different elements, for some systems that I've been involved with, it's one thing. It's affiliating with an HMO, or it's merging with a, a partner organization. But here we're talking about looking at the different needs and how, the different elements of this structure and how do they fit together. So the CCC, for example, is outpatient care, inpatient care. Uh, when we talk about the medical school part of it, it's, it's pipeline of new physicians. Uh, we talk about the federally qualifieds and Seton's physicians working together. That's what we call a patient-centered medical home. And all of these, and then you talk about the new hospital and the teaching. Residency elevates the quality of care for any system that you're in. So, 
So, and residency needs, you know, is better when it has medical schools and there's a pipeline of new physicians. So all of these pieces coming together, I think, work for a truly transformative, a complex, a very complicated arrangement, but a truly transformative one, uh, and I think very innovative as well. The other thing I really like about it is it's long-term focused, and I think that's maybe a, a, a nature, something about Austin, and really looking about the future and future generations. So we're talking about a medical school. You know, a lot of a lot of communities want a medical school, a lot of communities, but, but you have to be long, you know, future thinking. And we're thinking about the, how the medical school plays into the CCC and how everything plays into um, uh, what we're, the, the, the delivery, delivery system we're talking about right now. It also leverages existing funds. Uh, many systems I've been involved with, they're trying to be transformative and they're, they're doing what they can, but they don't, they don't really know how to fund it. So they're trying to reduce their costs, their, their expenditures, and at the same time, they're trying to transform. Whereas here, I think we found through the 1115 waiver and the district funds um, that there's a legitimate way to transform care and fund that transformation. And I think that's uh, very powerful. One thing that I am particularly, uh, I, I totally love is, uh, about this is physician leadership. I'm a physician myself. And um, one of the things I preach when I'm out with other clients is, the only way to be successful in future under healthcare reform is to have physician leadership at the table. Um, and today we were in uh, this room uh, with Mark Hernandez, uh, the ch chief medical officer of uh, 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 Tamara, who's the chief medical officer of the Lone Star, and we have people from uh, community care and from ATCIC, and we have physicians sitting around the table. And they're the ones who are crafting the clinical strategy for the CCC. And that in itself, I can tell you, just that alone, that collaboration amongst those physicians in this community is truly transformative, even without the other parts. Uh, so when you plug that into it, um, it's different. You don't see that um, in other communities. Um, but the collaboration goes beyond the physicians. It goes all the way to collaboration amongst uh, entities, uh, you know, um, uh, Seton, uh, Central Health, all the other entities that will have to come together uh, to make this work. So I think that's, that's again, probably something that's uh, unique to Austin as a community. Um, through Central Health, the nice thing, too, is that there is a level of transparency to the public, which in a lot of systems, when they're transforming, because they're not public entities, they don't have to ask the, they don't have to talk to the public that much. And I think the quality of the transformation is better when you can get the public input into that. And just by nature of this partnership uh, of Central Health being there and the board being so focused on that and making sure, as I've heard you say many times, that transparency is, 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 is critical and we have to make sure that that's always there, um, I think it actually improves the quality of the delivery system uh, that we're talking about. Uh, I won't go through everything, but there's a lot here, you know, focused on, on the vulnerable. Um, there is no, you know, the core agenda is let's focus on this, this population that is very needy, that needs help uh, from a, a health care, and do it in a way, as Greg said, that is uh, more, than just, more than just transactional. Really change, uh, make the care for those people better. But it benefits the whole city, too. And it benefits all the residents in Travis County if we can make uh, this work and, and, uh, properly. So I think it's very important. So having said all of that, I think that what what is exciting about this for, uh, in, in, in for Central Health and for the partners is that it goes beyond the triple aim. The triple aim is, is, is why everyone is beginning to do this. But it goes beyond that, that. Many probably don't know this here, but a year ago when we started talking about trans, or more than that, started talking about transformation and district and all of that, the Central Health Board insisted that any changes, and this is before we even got to this, this discussion of all of these kinds of big changes, that any changes that occur must meet the priorities identified by Central Health um, uh, through data analysis, through consulting, uh, et cetera, um, for this population. So it's, it, so yes, there's the triple aim of quality and cost and, and population health, but I, what I have seen is that there is a, under that, there is a very real focus on what do the people in Travis County, the vulnerable, what do they specifically need? And does this transformation address that? Increased primary care access, increased specialty access, behavioral health access, better coordination of care, and the list goes on. Um, and that, and women's health, and all of that has been a core theme throughout all of these discussions as, um, that I've been in. 
And so that, again, uh, makes it very, very um, uh, uh, good. And Dr. so- Dr. Andy, may I ask you one question? Because yes. Because you've provided an excellent landscape for the, the national environment. But one of the other things that I don't want us to lose sight of as we go through this process this evening, and particularly for our guests uh, from the public who are here, is you've been helpful to us in a host of ways. I'm coming to that question yes. in just a moment. But we as Texans love to tout our uniqueness. We are rather unique. Um, and so it's hard for us to take a model from somewhere else and plump yes. it down here. And so that goes to your point about the uniqueness of what we're doing here that may set a model for the nation. But one of the things you have been very um, helpful in helping us walk through as a board is the process piece. Each place you've worked with, you've been CEO of many systems, you consult to many systems now. Um, they're all unique in terms of their process. Can you talk briefly about process and the agreement piece in terms of what you've experienced nationally relative to what we're going through here to get to our agreements and right. moving forward beyond that? Right. Well, I, you know, I'll take, um, obviously, I, won't, I don't want to go in the wrong direction, I, so you know, keep me on track in terms of specific answers um, and ask me uh, as you need to. But I think um, the process is, um, well, beyond the fact that it's been a very good process to watch because of the collaborative nature that I've mentioned already between the different partners. But this, this is really a, um, this, is, this is historic. When you're uh, doing this type of level of transformation that will change healthcare delivery in Travis County and beyond uh, for decades to come, um, it's it, it's not like uh, it's not transactional like you're building a new clinic or you're doing. This is something where um, there's a lot of trust that has to be involved in it. Um, there's a little bit, in so, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned about kind of going out on a limb. Mm -hmm. um, to get these types of things done, all the parties have to go out on a limb. This is my experience, slightly. So, for example, um, you know, uh, universities, there's a big risk in starting a medical school. And you do it knowing that other partners, including the public, will help you to do that now and in future. With central health, there's a risk in creating a uh, community care collaborative where that collaborative, led by physicians, directs the strategies on care um, and the board holds them accountable. But it's a different way of doing care. There's risks when, you, when um, an organization like Seaton decides you know, it's going to be, uh, it's, it's new, you know, it's going to build a new hospital with the capital risks involved and that new hospital, the whole system is going to be responsible for safety net care um, and it's going to be held accountable and, is, you know, there's risks involved in that. But all parties have to come together to accomplish this type of historic change and I, I, would, I would suspect it's the same for any historic change that has occurred, uh, you know, in, in, in our country, that parties have to come together and trust has to be there, and certain risks have to be, uh, you know, agreed that you know we will we will do that, and we'll mitigate the risks uh, to make sure that public funds and everything is are not in jeopardy. Um, but it's one of those things that people have to be uh, have to come out and be much bigger than um, than they might have been in a smaller uh, uh, a transaction. So I have seen that here, and um, I don't know if that gets to it anything does you're saying. Perfectly. Right. Thank you very much. So. Um, one of the one of the other things I've really liked uh, or I've seen about this is um, it, protecting the safety net um, and really making sure and the and the, the board here again part of the <laughs> core themes have been well we want to make sure that the cert this is about the vulnerable in its core so making sure that's there and I want to say a few words about that because this is a different way of viewing safety net provision of care in this case. Um, instead of a sort of UMC Brackenridge where, you know, it is uh, operated by Seton and, you know, it's, it's, that, is the, that, is the, that is what we look at as the safety net hospital. It's a, there's a new teaching hospital and it's part of a system and that system uh, is the safety net system. And so the couple of things I wanted to say, and I know I've said this before in private as well, is that um, in my experience, um, 
and this is again just my experience, the, the absolute best partners for this type of arrangement, not to say others cannot be involved, others cannot be sort of the, the anchor uh, uh, safety net uh, partner, are faith-based organizations like Seton. And I have a lot of experience with faith-based organizations and Catholic health systems in particular, and I can tell you that they do consider safety net care to be their mission as well. Now every hospital does, does care, uh, provides care for the safety net, and every hospital in this community will continue to buy, provide care. But I can assure you, uh, and I have no affiliation with Seton in any way, that they do consider this to be their mission as well. And the reason I can say that is I managed, um, I was the CEO of Providence Healthcare, which is a Catholic health system in Spokane, Washington, amongst other Catholic systems that I've managed. And that one has, a, a, we had 653 beds in our main hospital, uh, 270 beds in a smaller one down the road, 120 bed children's hospital, two critical access hospitals, physician group, et cetera, all the things you would expect to have. And there is no other public hospital in that community. There is no public hospital in that community. That Catholic system, we saw ourselves based on our mission as being uh, the uh, safety net for that community. So because of that, I think the, the, there is a real alignment of mission. Um, I also think that um, Seton is a, is a proven partner. Uh, they've been here, you've worked together. Um, and so, uh, and when you sit with the physicians and you watch the physicians work with the federally qualifieds and take leadership for this, um, I'm quite comfortable that, you know, the partners at the table are the right partners, and it's really about how do we uh, make sure that we bring that together in the right way and, and, and seize the opportunity uh, that's, that's before us um, in the right way, of course. Um, before I just close my comments, I just want to say um, I would be remiss if I didn't say that, um, because I know you're not going to say it yourselves, uh, so I would say this to the board, that I have been to say I've been impressed, uh, I've been blown away with the amount of time this board has spent on these issues and on this proposal. And it's, it's appropriate because this is historic, this is groundbreaking, uh, with that comes risk and huge rewards as well. Um, but it's appropriate, but I'm not sure everyone knows how many meetings and how much time and how much uh, you have uh, really pushed uh, everybody to make sure that, uh, one, that you fully understand it, two, that, um, that your, your role uh, in terms of fiscal responsibility and stewardship uh, is, is really forefront uh, and also about the transparency. So I'll just um, say thank you for your leadership and um, I'll stop and take any questions you might have. I think we'll save questions until we get to our discussion point, but thank you very much for that national landscape and then also honing in on the context of getting to such an agreement and the process associated with such. Our next speakers are also those who are near and dear to us in several ways. Uh, we have John Stevens, who's the former CFO, <coughs> excuse me, for Central Health, who is serving in a very pivotal role as project manager for uh, the CCC and our illustrious legal counsel, uh, Mr. David Hilgers, and uh, they both will again walk us through specific aspects of the master agreement, including the new lease agreement and services agreement. Welcome again, and again, sleeping bags for you guys too. You know, you've been here uh, around the clock uh, for months, months, months now, and we appreciate your efforts in being here with us this evening. Thank you, Brenda. Um, I want to talk first about these uh, three community <coughs> objectives that uh, we feel like um, we have have been working on for more than a year now um, and we feel like we are, we are delivering a good product um, then I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about the <coughs> risks uh, dr. Andy mentioned the risks that are involved in entering into a transaction like this which are real uh, as are the the rewards and uh, talk about what we've done in working with the board to mitigate um, some of the risks that we've talked about as we've gone through this process and then talk about the benefits to the community so let me first just mention um, the objectives here of the master agreement uh, i think first of all and very importantly 
Uh, what the master agreement does is implement the will of the voters. The voters approved this, as you know, in November of uh, 2012. And prior to that, um, the Board of Managers approved a letter of intent with Seton in April of 2012. So we have been working on this for more than a year now uh, and on the 1115 waiver as well. But if you look back at the letter of intent and at presentations that we made at that same time on the letter of intent, I think you'll see that what we are delivering to you in this master agreement is entirely consistent with what we said we were going to do with, uh, with the board and with Seton and what we told the voters that we were gonna do. Uh, this master agreement also greatly strengthens the safety net and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. And as Dr. Andy mentioned, it, it transforms the delivery <clears throat> system in a way that we would not have been able to accomplish if we not, had not taken um, as broad uh, a, a swipe at this as we have. So this presentation, uh, in, including David, is going to talk first about risk analysis, um, some of the community concerns that uh, the board addressed, and how the master agreement mitigates those risks, then talk about the benefits to the community, and then David's going to take over and talk about uh, the lease agreement the, uh, for the existing UMCB facility and the services agreement. One of, the, one of the questions I think that has been rightly posed is, um, does the master agreement put the safety net hospital in, je in jeopardy? In other words, is that something that the community is going to lose? Um, as you know, uh, we have University Medical Center as the sort of the, the linchpin um, of the safety net system, at least as far as acute care is concerned. Um, but we don't operate that hospital. And so, you know, if you consider that the hospital is just a building, we will still own the building. We'll still own University Medical Center in Brackenridge. And at least in the initial years of the master agreement with Seton, if for whatever reason the agreement came undone, we would always have the option to go back and use that same facility if the teaching hospital has not been built at that point. And then if, you know, if you consider that a hospital is an institution, which it is, um, then we have really strengthened um, the safety net and our ability to hold on to it because we have a legally binding commitment for service continuity that we do not now have in place. And further, if Seton defaults or breaches, we can buy the teaching hospital, the equipment, and the licenses. We don't have the ability to do that under with UMCB right now. If Seton were to walk away from that facility, which they obviously have no intention of doing, but if they were to do that, we would have to scramble to get a license, we'd have to scramble to get doctors, and so on. So we think that our position relative to the safety net hospital has been improved and greatly improved. Uh, I know there's been a concern about losing access to women's health care services. Um, the first point I would, I would make is that, again, with Seton at, at uh, UMCB, that arrangement has been in place for 18 years. There were some changes that were made to that agreement, as you know, to accommodate the fact that due to ethical and religious directives, Seton could not perform certain procedures at the hospital, but we have always found a way uh, to work that out. And our goal is not only to maintain the services, but to expand them as we've done through our network of providers. <coughs> and in fact, as you know, we have some of the DESRIC projects that we're gonna be carrying out for the 1115 waiver, in fact, do strengthen uh, women's services that are gonna be provided to our population. But finally, and, and probably most important, Central Health has the unilateral right under the master agreement to approve, fund, and deliver any women's health services that are allowed by law. Um, Chair, could I say a couple words on sure. this? Um, in terms of the women's services, I've had the opportunity to talk with a 
quite a few people of late, and we had the opportunity to go to in front of the City of Austin Health and Human Services subcommittee yesterday <coughs> and, and talk about our arrangement and talk about women's health services. And I've had the opportunity to clarify a couple of things that I think will be worthwhile to clarify here today. Um, there has been um, maybe some misunderstandings about what this, this the change in our relationship with Seton means. Um, I have heard uh, uh, statements made that sent that Seton Healthcare family will be taking over the operations of our primary care clinics, and that is incorrect. This in no way changes who is operating our primary health care clinics. Seton will continue to provide hospital services as it does under the, its current agreement and will provide specialty care services. But um, this, this arrangement does not in, in any way change who runs community care, who runs People's Community Clinic, who runs Lone Star Circle of Care, who runs El Buen Samaritano. Those, those operations stay intact and there's no change. Um, a couple of other things. Um, this agreement does not in any way change the health services that are being, the women's health services that are being provided today and have been provided for the last 18 years. We, uh, there's no reason to change them. There's no need to change them. We have partnerships with all of our primary care providers, with our hospital partners such as St. David's. And we in Central Health has assured women's services are in place for our community since the, our inception and following the, the, the path of the city of Austin before us. We know that there's been a tremendous amount of pressure at the state level to change women's services and access to women's services. And I think it's fair to say that Central Health has been a champion in Travis County in making sure that those services are provided. And our relationship with Seton has no bearing on that. Central Health is the entity responsible for women's services, not Seton. And that is retained in this agreement just as it's been very explicitly stated in other agreements. So there should be no fear about women's health services going forward because nothing in this agreement is going to impact it whatsoever. And Central Health, and I'm sure my, <coughs> the board would chime in and say that we are absolutely committed to women's services, especially given the environment that we continue to operate in in Texas and the pressure from the legislature to reduce access. So thank you for allowing me. I think of course, just to add to that, I think it might be important to say it's always been sort of one of the top uh, pieces of, of information in our guiding principles. We've never, yes. never not had that as one of the very top things. Yes. Is the guiding principle piece or vision? Sorry to interrupt, John. Very uh, uh, appropriate. Mm -hmm. uh, one other question I think that's um, that's been uh, in the community is: <coughs> Is there something about this agreement that's going to give Seton a financial advantage, and uh, or or a windfall, for example? And um, the answer is no. Uh, first of all, because Seton, as you know, Seton is committing to provide the same level of care it provides for the same value of compensation that, that it's receiving now, not only while the master agreement is in place, but in certain conditions, well, under conditions, that if the master agreement terminates, they will continue to provide services for another five years. That is another strengthening of the safety net. And then, um, as you well know, Seton is contributing $250 million of its own funds to build a new, modern, state-of-the-art uh, teaching hospital. Well, what about in the future? Will there be a financial advantage in the future? Um, under the master agreement, Seton cannot impose additional payment from C uh, Central Health unilaterally. You know, that is a reserve power to, uh, to both parties. If a funding deadlock arises, in other words, as we go forward, each year we'll put a budget into place, and if we cannot agree on a budget or how it's going to be funded, then we will have what we call a funding deadlock. Um, that will then put us into a dispute resolution process if we get that far, and if that's not resolved, Central Health or Seton has the option to terminate. But again, if they do terminate, they have to provide <coughs> services for at least five years at the same value that they were providing them in the last year before uh, the termination of the master agreement. And then finally, uh, again, a final uh, very strong provision, I think, that is, <coughs> is that if during that five-year period Seton fails to provide the services, uh, Central Health then has the option to buy the teaching hospital equipment, the licenses, and so on. And so really when you look at it, uh, 
you know, from the from the perspective of both parties, we have a substantial interest in making this agreement work. Uh, both parties um, have gone through a vigorous process of give and take in terms of the master agreement, and we both have uh, a great interest in making it work. So what are some of the risks that remain? Well, under the master agreement, one of the risks, I think, is the underperformance of the Deseret projects. In other words, the federal funds that are going to come down to help us uh, at least initiate this transformation of the delivery system. So that is uh, certainly a concern, and it's something that both parties are going to need to work uh, very hard on. Then one other risk that is really just inherent to the healthcare industry, again, thinking back to what Dr. Andy was saying, there are so many changes in the industry now, tectonic changes taking place. Um, there's always the possibility that something else is going to come down the road and cause us to have to go back to the table and revisit the master agreement. But right now we have no idea what those are. There's also the possibility that something good will happen. For example, the waiver will continue or there'll be an additional source of federal funding that we don't even know about now. That has been our experience, Central Health's experience, um, so we'll hope for that. And how are we going to deal with them? We, uh, we will just have to work together with Seton through the CCC um, and be vigilant in responding to whatever's going on in the healthcare environment, what's going on with our costs, what's going on with the MAP population, and so on. Let's move then to talk about the community benefits. The language you see down there at the bottom is what was on the ballot that the voters approved. Uh, in November and so you see down at the bottom there that one of the there were a number of things mentioned uh, in addition to uh, the new medical school a site for a teaching hospital trauma services specialty medicine training uh, primary care behavioral and mental health care prevention and wellness programs and then finally uh, federal matching funds as you know, our intent is to first use the new property tax revenue that we're going to get in 2014 to draw down additional federal funds. So we will always work first to maximize those. If there is some of that additional revenue left over, then we will transfer that to the CCC and, and uh, figure out jointly with Seton the best way uh, to use that money. But uh, these were these were uh, things that the board was uh, very keen on, and again, they were in the letter of intent and they're in the master agreement. <clears throat> Certainly what the community gets out of this is a new medical school, which is a big deal. Uh, there are gonna be economic benefits that come from that. I, uh, some of you I know are, are familiar with John Hawkins Yosa's study, and I can't quote the numbers from <coughs> it, but he expects that it will have the school alone, the faculty who move here, the students will have uh, a significant economic benefit to the community. And then certainly just in terms of building the school, there'll be um, some construction jobs that will be available. That's the case with the new teaching hospital as well. So both of those are going to uh, help the Austin economy, the Travis County economy. Um, the community will also then get a transformed delivery system that we think will be improved in a lot of different ways. They'll also get increased transparency. Um, the, the board and members of the public who attend the, um, the public sessions of the CCC board, there'll be six of those a month, uh, six of those a year rather, um, they will end up, I think, with a much better understanding of what's going on in the total health care delivery system and what it's doing uh, to benefit the community. There'll be more open meetings and opportunity for public input. We've talked about this, the secure and sustainable um, safety net. Better access to care for our most vulner vulnerable populations. Uh, certainly there will be expanded hours for primary and specialty care that are intended, those additional hours are intended to be there for people who um, who can't take their kids to the clinic during the day or who can't go themselves to the clinic during the day. And that's going to help keep people on the job and it's going to help kids uh, keep, 
keep kids in school. So that is another economic benefit, I think, arguably, uh, to the community, but certainly to families and to individuals. Uh, there'll be more health care providers. We'll have a pipeline of uh, doctors that will come here either to teach um, in the medical school or to, to work as residents or interns uh, at the teaching hospital. There'll be shorter wait times in the ER at both public and private facilities. There are a number of things that we're doing to transform the delivery system that are not just going to help um, Seton and the Seton facilities. Uh, when we are able to see people at the right time, the right place, and give them the right care, rather than having them go to the emergency room, that's going to help uh, Seton, it's going to help St. David's, it's going to help all the hospitals here in Travis County. And uh, we will certainly have better behavioral and mental health services. Um, as you all know, the Austin Travis County Integral Care is, um, is participating with us in the 1115 waiver and they have a number of very significant Deseret projects. Uh, we are hoping that ultimately they end up working with us in the CCC, collaborating with us in Seton. There are 26 Deseret projects that are going to be carried out, including women's health, behavioral health, primary and specialty care, and information technology. Uh, greater certainty, again, on the continuity of hospital care that Seton will provide, even if the master agreement terminates, and then, again, the option to purchase the teaching hospital if Seton defaults or breaches the master agreement. So I think those uh, benefits are significant, and unless the board has some questions, I'll turn it over to David and let him go to work on the services agreement. Yeah, I, let me let me give a little background here first. Uh, what we have been operating under for the last 18 years is one lease agreement, <clears throat> and that lease agreement contained all of the provisions that governed the relationship between Seton and Central Health. Uh, it was a huge document, uh, some of which over time has been forgotten or not utilized. Uh, some of it was very confusing and some was very ambiguous. So what we felt we had to do in putting this relationship together was clean that document up. So we created the master agreement, which is John talked about as a constitution, which lays out what the, the agreement is. And then we had a lease agreement, which I'll talk about, which is basically the lease between existing UMCB and Seton, which we have now, but much more elaborate and complicated because of, uh, it included services and all sorts of other things. And then the service agreement is our second, our second ancillary agreement. The service agreement exists because we needed to to delineate what services are being provided and what those costs are. And it did not make sense to put those all in one document. It made more sense to put them in, in several documents. So uh, what we've done now is we've worked on the master agreement. Uh, we're going to talk about both the services and the lease agreement. Um, you, you should know that, uh, that we have many of the, the provisions of the services agreement and the lease agreement are, are already agreed to, but there are some areas that we still haven't gotten language on, and that's why we talked about, <clears throat> Brenda, we were going to have to, to defer this mm -hmm. decision for another week or so because we're going to spend all next week trying to finalize the documents, <clears throat> and we wanted to make sure those documents made sense uh, and were not confused as, as perhaps the original lease agreement was. But let's talk about the services agreement first. Um, this is important because it, is, it's, it establishes the current level of services that Seton's providing uh, to MAP and charity care patients. That's the, the, uh, that was what was in the lease, and we now have delineated specifically because some of those services had changed over time. Over 18 years, what you did maybe back in 1994, you've changed some. So we've delineated those services in, in, the, in the agreement. Uh, we established a value. What is the value of those services. And, and that is important because the master agreement, as John has said, requires Seton to continue to provide the same level of services at the current uh, cost or value 
uh, over the next, uh, during the term of this agreement. So we needed to get that established, and that took quite a bit of time to try to figure what the, the, the services were actually and what the, the uh, cost of it were, and, and everybody worked very hard to do that. Now, as we go forward, it is our expectation, like just in the past, these services will change, that there'll be a need to change these services. So the service agreement has a process by which uh, Seton and Central Health can get together and make changes in the services that are, are provided and, or that the funding that we're going to pay Seton one way or the other. So we didn't really have that process before. It was more haphazard, and now we have a process that's going to do that. Is it? <clears throat> um, the, the major provisions in this are that we're going to attach a list of, of current services. We have an attachment that shows those services. It establishes a, a value. This is uh, approximate or tentative, but it's about $56,300,000 annually. And that is the value of the services that Seton provides to us right now for MAP and charity care. Um, that we, we agree that this level cannot be changed, this level or the, the level of services or the value cannot be changed without the approval of both sides. So this is, we're, we're, we have to cooperate. This is one of those things that, that in many, throughout this agreement, is collaboration, is cooperation, it's working together to try to determine what the community needs and make determinations of how that can be provided. But we have to agree to make any changes. There's an audit mechanism that allows Central Health to see if Seton is meeting the, the, the requirements. Uh, are they providing the same access to care that, that they agreed to provide? The same level of care, the same clinical quality and patient satisfaction requirements we have. So we have mechanisms by which we, we're going to have parameters, we're going to have protocols and, and uh, amounts of services they have to provide, and those are in the agreement, and then we go ahead and say we have the ability to audit that, look at your records, and see what, whether this is being uh, met or not. So that's uh, in this agreement as well. And as I said, it will provide a process by which the parties will review the level of services and, and the values of it. Any changes have to be done by agreement, but we, we expect that every year, at least every year, we will go through an evaluation, and the CCC will be very much involved in this because the CCC will be <coughs> making the ultimate decision as to whether changes can be made or not. That is <coughs> the central health part of CCC. Uh, we'll be making those changes, determination, and those things will be made uh, after uh, the advice of actuaries, at the, after the advice of clinicians as to what we need to do to change, and then we have a mechanism to do that, and we're going to have a written agreement that we have done it so that somebody can't just say, oh, well, I think we changed that uh, a couple of years ago. There has to be something in, in definite in writing to do that. <clears throat> already said that, that no changes can be made. Uh, just these are the list of things that no changes can be made on. Eligibility of MAP or charity patients, that cannot be done without agreement of both sides. Uh, the amount of co-payments that people are required to pay can't be done without uh, the agreement. The value of the services can't be done without a change without agreement. Changes in the level or availability of services cannot be done. The number of MAP patients cannot be changed uh, without agreement and changes that adversely affect Seton or Seton providers uh, can't be done without agreement. <clears throat> um, Seton does have the ability to change locations. As, and they have, uh, they may from time to time want to consolidate, centralize some of the things they're doing instead of having it all scattered. And so they do have the ability to change the sites. Uh, they will be providing certain types of services. They have to give us notice of those those changes and allow us to, to, to communicate with them about it. Any questions on the services agreement at this point? <clears throat> um, I should say that, that the termination provisions are, we, we it's a 25-year term, but exactly how the termination provisions are going to be, be worked are a little bit complicated because we have to coordinate them with the master agreement which remember, we may terminate the master agreement, but there's at least five years where they can have to continue to provide services, and they'll need a hospital to do that. They're not going to be able to say, if we terminate the lease and kick them out, they can't provide services. So these, these provisions are a little bit complicated that we're working through, and that's one of the reasons we're, we're having a little delay. The lease agreement. As I said, this 
we plan to have two leases eventually. We have this lease agreement, which will provide for the lease of UMCB over the next three to four to five years uh, as the teaching hospital is built. At some point, the teaching hospital will take over. We will sign a lease with uh, Seton on that uh, facility, and we will have to uh, determine what happens with the lease here. Uh, it's ex expected that probably there will be use, some use of UMCB, even though the new teaching hospital is in place. But it's expected this lease agreement will only last until that teaching hospital is in place. <clears throat> so <clears throat> it, it sets forth the obligations of the parties while Seton is leasing UMCB, and we tried to retain as many of the provisions that existed in the, the existing lease except for the services provisions that we tried to, to take out. And to the degree that, that we needed to put things in the master agreement as opposed to the lease, we took those things out and tried to make it really basically a lease. So there are typical uh, provisions that we'll talk about that you have in a lease. Uh, as I said, the lease needs to assure that Seton will have a hospital to provide the services if the master agreement terminates, that we, we will have that five years of services that we can look for so that central health can make decisions on what to do over those five years while Seton is providing those services for five years. But we needed to make sure they have a hospital to do it. So that's, that's uh, how, how we're dealing with that issue. Seton shall at least the entire campus except for the clinic that we had is now a standalone clinic within the facility. Uh, that, that we will essentially, uh, this deals with that. The lease payment is unchanged. We have not changed the lease payment at all. That continues as it has been already agreed to. Uh, Seton does owe us some rent uh, because we had, uh, because of the, the, the fall issue we had when we, when we changed the disproportionate share allocation and so forth. So we've had to deal with that. And there's a catch up rent that they'll have to pay going back to October that when we sign this. The use of the facility. Um, David, mm -hmm. can I just clarify, is the clinic that you just referred to, is that the high risk OB clinic? Yes, right. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. That's the clinic. Mm -hmm. um, Seton must maintain uh, UMCB as part of the safety net. Uh, and we have a definition of safety net that's in the master agreement that they have to continue that use. They also have to maintain <coughs> a level one tra trauma center. Well, we talked about this last time, a level two or a level one depending on whether or not we have to get a level two before we can get a level one in the new hospital, <coughs> in the hospital, but we planned it uh, to be a level one. And uh, maternity and women's services will have to be provided, uh, excluding those that are, uh, that are uh, prohibited by the ERDs of Seton. Um, Seton cannot restrict the exercise of religion by any, any person uh, utilizing the facility. These are the standard ground lease provisions that you'll find in any one. <clears throat> who maintains the, the promised property? Who repairs it? Uh, who's taking care of the environmental law concerns? Uh, who's providing the insurance? Who's going to identify for claims arising from the operation <coughs> of, the ho of the hospital? Uh, casualty, what happens if, the f if there's a fire? Who has to take care of that? Uh, condemnation, how those are things are taken care of. And this ground lease is, let me say, very favorable to, uh, you, to Central Health. Uh, Seton has all those responsibilities in the, the lease, just as they always have had in the past. So those did not change at all. But a lot of the lease has provisions around those, those, those elements of the lease. Um, these provisions are not, the termination provisions are not final, as I said, as we're trying to work through those to get these all coordinated between the master agreement, the service agreement, and the, the lease agreement. Um, but uh, I think we're very close. Uh, we'll also provide that the new teaching hospital is not built. Seton will lease UMCB during the post-termination uh, services, and that's the protection on the five years again. That we have protection if, if for some reason Seton doesn't build the teaching hospital, and if we decide, well, we're done, we're going to terminate the agreement because you didn't do that. They, we still have a provision that they have to provide services for five years, and we have a provision that allows them to lease the hospital, UMCB, during those five years, so we can determine what to do with it. There is a guarantee of the lease. Seton has a parent company 
which is uh, Seton Healthcare Family, and they have a this, the entity that will be actually providing the services and taking doing the lease is going to be a subsidiary. It's a subsidiary with most of the money, but it's a subsidiary nevertheless. So we're getting a guarantee from the um, the parent company of all the requirements that Seton has to, to meet in the lease. So we have uh, both both the crucial entities uh, providing uh, a guarantee of those services. And that is the, uh, that's a quick overview of the, of the service agreement and the lease agreement. Can I have sure, a Tom. question now? Or Tom, if you have one, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what you meant by the, uh, it says changes it on slide 23, the number of MAP patients. Could you explain yeah, we, we, what that means? We have agreed that they're uh, paying, that they are providing t uh, uh, services to 25,000 MAP patients. That's what they're required to pay. Are provided, are required to provide under the, uh, the existing amount of uh, value of services we're providing. Right now, I think uh, it, the number is actually like 21 or 23,000 uh, that we're providing services to. And obviously, if we expand that number, uh, that costs Seton more money. And so we've agreed that this is what you're providing now, this is the value what you're providing. And if we expand that, agree to expand it, we have to agree to expand it. <coughs> they have to agree to expand it, then uh, they will uh, be paid more money. Well, you know, the way we do it now is kind of like people, if they're eligible and they want to sign up, then they sign up and there's no top number or no bottom number. Will this restrict the number of people that can sign up? 25,000 would be the, the amount that, that Seton would have to provide services to. It doesn't restrict the amount that would sign up, but it does uh, mean that Seton uh, gets more money if there's an additional uh, number of patients. And that can be changed. It doesn't have to be a year. That could be changed at any time. The I mean, if there's a flood of people up to 30,000, say, we Yeah, we don't have to do it every year. I we, would, no, if we, we can and, do it any time <clears throat> right. we feel, our seat and feel like we need to do it, or we feel like we need to do it. That's correct. But it has to be agreed upon. Yeah, we right. I understand that. that. Okay. I have a question. Sure. So what does that do to, you know, we talked MAP and then MAP2, and then the transfer of these, um, of MAP and I guess the creation of MAP2 within the CCC, where we're already at like 21,000 plus, mm -hmm. you know, there was talk about that going up significantly, mm -hmm. especially if you're going to be um, working with people in the MAP2 who have two plus chronic diseases. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we expecting for this to happen, you know, five or ten years from now or in the near future? It, it will not happen right away. It will Probably. it will happen in the future, but um, we're first going to have to get through all of the Deseret projects to implement those projects, make sure that we've secured the funding, uh, and then depending on how the additional funding looks at that point, we'll begin to expand that population with the two-plus chronic condition patients. But also remember that within the current 21,000, there's some number that we've already identified right. that are the two plus five conditions. Is that <clears throat> eight, eight to 10,000? So. Eight, yeah. roughly. So within that, we're already talking about serving those existing enrollees differently. Okay. Other comments or questions before our final presenter? Well, we will have a chance to ask later. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. David and John, as always, we thank you for your great efforts in your time and clarity our final presenter before we have a brief recess and then public comment is trish young brown who's going to talk to us about the master agreement compared to our current agreement as well as the overall objectives of the master agreement and i think that i've got um about four slides i'm going to go through and i'm not sure who's going to run my slideshow for i'll do it John will. thank you so i want to run through um what I think are the, you know, the benefits of this agreement and, and try to tie up a few of our, our com comments from today. So five always seems like a good number that people can try to remember. Three to five is a good, good, good memory um, uh, approach. So we've listed out five that we think are the main benefits. And the first is that it continues and strength strengthens the ability of central health to provide quality health care within the tax rate approved by the voters. And I know it's been touched on in a various of presentations, but we really have changed 
the alter underlying relationship between Seton and Central Health around the care delivery <coughs> system. What we had before, what we have now until we make this change is a very contractually oriented system or an agreement that says that Seton will do certain things and will do certain things, but it doesn't require us to work together in the way that we are proposing to work together. And it also doesn't have the assurances um, really on either party's part that we're committed to this in the long term. Seton has the ability essentially to, um, you know, under the terms of the agreement, pay a penalty and hand us back the keys and say it's yours to run and likewise we can terminate it as well. So we have created a much more um, <coughs> a closely uh, risk-oriented relationship where it, 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 it's going to be difficult for either one of us to back out, so to speak, without making adequate provisions for service delivery. It also ensures that, that there's five years notice before seat can alter the current level of services. So if this master agreement would, would terminate, there's a five-year window where seat is obligated and that gives Central Health the opportunity <coughs> to make a, prepare a response. And again, we don't have that today. It provides an option to acquire the new hospital that Seton is going to build um, if Seton breaches the master agreement we, that was touched on earlier. Um, it, this master agreement allows Central Health to oversee and exercise substantial control over the integrated delivery system and the district projects. We're not giving that up. We are working with our partner to make sure that those are successful. And it provides for a new safety net hospital, which is very, very important for our community, not only in replacing the existing aging Brackenridge Hospital, but being there to serve the new medical school as we grow our medical education efforts for this community. And so what are we trying to accomplish with the master agreement? Um, one, it implement, this implements the mandate of the voters. We established a letter of intent with Seton in April of 2012. And we've remained consistent throughout the process by focusing on fulfilling the mandate of the voters to build the new medical school to build a new teaching hospital and to create an integrated delivery system with enhanced care. All of that, again, was provided in the letter of intent that was signed last April and it's been our, our blueprint, so to speak, that we've been working with to um, create these agreements that support that letter of intent. What are we trying to accomplish with the master agreement? First of all, we're trying to strengthen the safety net. We know that we're going to improve the infrastructure. We're going to protect current services and enhance service delivery through the medical school effort in terms of uh, creating additional services and providers. The teaching hospital providing um, a new facility in which to provide care and educate um, our upcoming uh, healthcare professionals. And the community care collaborative, which we've discussed extensively, which transforms how we deliver care in the, in the hopes that we are in fact going to create a better quality of life for the patients we're serving and we're going to become a much more sustainable system from a cost perspective over time. And I think that sustainability is something that is facing not just us locally but really the state of Texas and, and the nation as a whole and why there is so much change happening in the healthcare system because it is about sustainability in the future. We know that our population is growing. We know the cost of care is growing. We can't continue to deliver it the same way today and expect to have the funds in which to um, take care of our community. I think that um, another thing to keep in mind, and we, we talk about this a lot in when we're working on developing these agreements and in, in developing our partnership with Seton, is that we have an aligned mission. Seton is a much larger institution than Central Health. It, it spans its operations into multiple counties beyond Travis County. But within Travis County and within the populations that we both serve, we are, we are aligned. We're completely aligned. We have a large part of the equation in serving those patients. Seton has a large part of the equation in serving those patients. And so this CCC creates further alignment and compatibility with those missions. And I think also, we talked about this a lot last fall, but this, this opportunity through the 1115 waiver and the creation of the CCC is leveraging taxpayer monies to maximize federal match for our local services. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to bring down federal funds that will not only help us expand care, but help, change, help us change how care is delivered. And we could not do it without the voter approval in November. And now that the voters have in fact given us this approval, it's, it's incumbent upon us to execute on this vision and to make it happen so that we can 
earn the monies under this program, we can transform our health care delivery system. Thank you. Great. With that, we're going to take a very, very brief recess and start back up at 7 with public comment. By the way, if you've not signed up to provide public comment, you still have the opportunity to do so. So again, we will start up at 7, and I hereby recess us until 7 p.m. Thank you.